Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops, with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. you don't know exactly what's going on right now but we do know that there are some psyops going on right ma'am i don't know cinema psyops and i believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today why i believe that is because i know how it feels i know what it does to you cinema psyops they think it's something devious and brainwashing Fifth consecutive week of Cinema Psyops. That is 295 weeks of mediocrity, stupidity, and general tomfoolery and jackassery. I'm your host, Court. Speaking of a tomfool jackass, I've got a co host named Matt. Wow, mediocrity. That's high praise. We're, high praise. Uh, you must be in a good mood today. We're uh, working hard at being right in the middle of the pack. Yeah, we're working real hard at. Just being in the middle. <laughs> We're trying real hard to just be the Carpenters and Donnie and Marie. That's right. Jesus Christ. Just we're working real hard at just being Ringo. Ah, <laughs> uh, Jesus fucking Christ! So this is the genre I said that we have never had on our show before. Now A Western. Yes. Now some of our listeners would go, "Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah!" Uh, you covered Linda and Abilene. That took oh, place yeah. in a frontier town. There were horses and stuff involved. However, oh. that story was not a western at all. That was just yeah. a typical drama that took place in the frontier. Yeah, and it was a porno. Right, which also yeah. it, takes that, precedence. That, yeah, yeah, that's it, it. Was it was more porno than it was a western? I mean, that's just that's just real talk. Oh my god, just fucking incest already. That's what Linda <laughs> and Abilene is really yeah, about. That though. was really yeah. You're We're right. Just you're trying right. to prolong the amount of time that happens before. Before we watch this brother and sister fuck. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. All, this is. all right, so that's what took place in Linda and Abilene. It's more or less the drama, and it's a family story, and it's a story of a brother and sister who get to know each other a little too well. I mean, what are you doing, stepbrother? <laughs> all the kids in school say you're the hottest girl. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, 
I feel real fucked up right now. <laughs> we kind of just dimed ourselves out to the audience. If anybody else knows that what what we're referencing there, they're like, "Oh shit, these two. <laughs> oh, these two are fucking gross." <laughs> anyway, back to it. Um, so <laughs> this is this is actually, as far as I'm concerned, the first pretty much western because it's primarily a western. Yeah. And this is really interesting. This is sort of a giallo inspired type western. I know it's murder mystery yeah. and it's kind of doing a little bit more of a sort of an Agatha Christie murder mystery thing because you got your special gun for hire like it could be like Perot or whoever that comes into town and is there to, to investigate these murders that are happening and that's not giving anything away that's like the fucking byline of the movie yeah you know? pretty much yeah, yeah so but it's it's kind of an interesting hodgepodge and you know a bunch of different ideas thrown together and the problem is they didn't have something to emulsify properly so they don't really have a, a smoothie they, they have kind of a gazpacho because i don't think yeah. a lot of the elements really work and we'll really dig into that but uh this is definitely a movie that swung for the fucking fences and i got to give it props for that because there's some ballsy choices that they made in trying to mix these genres and while it may or may not work 100 percent for you there are parts when it does work and then there's others yeah. when it doesn't and they're kind of counteracting each other and we'll, we'll like i said we'll definitely talk about it but this alone is a very interesting film to actually talk about having just watched it <laughs> Yeah, but I was pleasantly surprised because it's a Western. So I was like, well, this is definitely our first Western. Yeah. And it's kind of it's kind of uh, like our first like old timey murder mystery yeah. type thing too because we haven't done also, we haven't really also, done well well we kind of did the it was sort of a murder mystery with the kid that was in the house doing all of the killing in the girls' school um, well, and the also house that screamed this, or whatever yeah and it's also more of an American centric movie than we've done recently yeah and like with a surprising number of cast members of James Garner comedies where he played yeah. the sheriff that everyone needed to support and at one point a gunfighter that everyone needed to support. Uh-huh. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I, I was like kind of surprised at how many people I recognized from those films specifically. There's at least two main cast members and some of the background actors I think looked familiar for those kinds of things too or at least some of the stunts yeah. were similar to support I, your local gunfighter and support your local sheriff. The only guy I really knew was the sheriff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's in a lot of stuff. You probably recognized him as the, the medic from the Cannonball Run movie though yes i mean that is uh that is true yes <laughs> jack Ilium is that gentleman's name yeah. yes now what's really bizarre is our main uh detective that we're about to dig into here and talk about as well he played gangrene i think was the character's name but he was like this really nasty biker dude in oh, the really? tom laughlin lensed born losers which is the first appearance of billy jack everybody thinks huh. billy jack was the first billy jack movie but born losers is actually the first one uh that's that is one hell of a fucking twisted biker flick, by the way. Ooh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, sh we should probably do that someday. I don't know. I, All right. I have covered it on Obsessive Cinema Discourse, if anybody would like to hear some interesting chaps talk about that and then myself. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Jesus. yeah, I recognize him and I'm like, this guy bugs me. He creeps me out. Why does he creep me out? What's so fucking wrong with him? Like, why is this bugging me? And then I looked him up and I'm like, oh, of course, he played gangrene in Board yeah. Losers. That's why I dislike him. That's that's why he's gross. <laughs> that's why he creeps me out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked enough about it. Enough beating around the bush. This is the longest fucking intro we've done in a really goddamn long fucking time. So here's the fucking Patreon ad for Legion Podcast. This will keep you quiet. <laughs> Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. 
We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. So in honor of this very American-centric Western-style tale that we have this week, I have chosen Americana and some very folk-inspired and traditional-inspired country and rock that I was able to find on the website Big Papa Bell Grab for us. Oh, well, thanks, Big Papa. <laughs> Yeah, so we got ourselves set up for that, but we do not have a trailer for this film this week, which was really surprising for me. Um, but yeah, that is that is kind of weird that there wouldn't be a trailer. Yeah, I, I guess one does not exist. There was not one out there. So whenever you're ready, just let's let's get going. All right. Well, it's the uh, the knife for the ladies. So first twenty minutes, we start off in a small western town, frontier town. Um, we see a man walking around. He's kind of drunk, it appears, or he's on his horse. I'm sorry. And then we see a pair of black boots walking. Um, then we cut to a guy he's getting ready to leave a lady of the evening and uh after he leaves she is murdered and her throat is slit and then we cut into the title sequence uh, it's important that he had plans like he wanted to come back and he was yeah, already he wanted to come to- back yeah it, it wasn't like you don't believe he's the murderer because he he wanted to you know he wanted some more of that so yeah he was definitely interested in trying to get back with this lady yeah. so you knew it wasn't she was him. like She's like, I'm just tired. Can you go? <laughs> she basically like, likes, yeah. she's like, you wore me out, champ. Go home. Like, yeah, yeah, right. They'll, you they'll, should, uh, there'll be more you after I recuperate. It. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she pulled another one of those kind of lines, but like this guy was actually like, okay. And he's stumbling around. It's important to note. He was definitely liquored up because he is yes. stumbling around and like halfway fallen over. Why he didn't just continue to sleep there, who knows? Because <laughs> he clearly yeah. just woke up because he was passed out. They probably fell asleep or, fucking. Unless she kicked him out. Maybe she woke up and like, get out of my bed. I'm not comfortable. Yeah. What, are you, what are you doing in here? <laughs> we then, after the title sequence, we cut to the town banker meeting with a detective in our first clip. Dear Mr. Burns, permit me to introduce myself. My name is Simeon Hollyfield, president of the Moscow City Bank. I am taking the liberty to come to see you regarding a matter of extreme urgency. During the past several months, our once peaceful town of Moscow has undergone a series of strange events. Three murders. But your letter only mentioned two. The night before I left, Letty Mills, a girl who lived in the hotel, she was stabbed just like the others. Horribly. Mr. Hollyfield, how does your bank figure into all this? Two years ago, we were one of the major copper centers in the Arizona Territory. But the mine played out, and now we're a, a small town getting smaller. Banks need people to stay in business. Do you want me to solve the murders or save your town? You asked me a question, I answered as best I could. Obviously, I've wasted your time, Mr. Burns. And mine. I simply meant that I can only help you solve the murders. Shall we begin? Who were the other victims? A few months ago, Travis Mescal, his family founded the town. 
was savagely knifed to death. Three weeks later, a young girl from the saloon was killed in the same way. How much authority would I have? All you need. I have the town council's permission. And my fee? Well, I've, I've stated the town's financial position. But Travis's mother has posted a $500 reward, and we'll take care of your expenses. The fee will be commensurate with your effort. And further, I personally will give you a letter of recommendation when you leave. Mr. Hollyfield, it's poor pay. But a rich challenge. I'll be there by week's end. Oh, uh, one more thing. You have to reckon with our Sheriff Jared Coldcord, a two-fisted bear of a man. I'll tell him you're coming, but if I know Jared, he won't take it kindly. I have a hard time believing Jack Ilium is a two-fisted bear of a man. He's a giant man. He's a very big yeah. man, but he's not intimidating. No, <laughs> not at all. He's a very goofy-looking gentleman, so he's never really been intimidating to me. No, but we cut to that sheriff, and he's griping, and it's more comical than it is nerve-wracking. Because that's uh, what Jack happy. Ilium does best. Yes, right? And um, there's there's a kid who hangs out with him, and uh, he's like, you know, shining a buckle, and he tells the kid that he has to get to his fiddle lessons before his mom gets real pissed. So the boy goes for his fiddle lessons, and while he's sitting there, he runs into a young lady named Nina, who is with another man named Ramon, and they're kind of talking, they say hi to him, and, you know, wish him luck on his fiddle lessons. So then we cut to the kids, you know, learning the fiddle. And then we see Nina while hanging up clothes. She is murdered by the killer. Uh, As the kid's leaving, he finds her body and screams in bloody horror. Um, The kid gets into town and tells everyone what he found. And, you know, the sheriff's there and, you know, everyone in town hears the kid yelling. Um, So so this whole entire town group, they kind of head to Nina's place. But one guy was overhearing the kid. He goes into the bar. He tells the bar owner about Ramon, how the kid saw Ramon there. And uh, so the bar owner really wants to be sheriff. So he's like, well, let's go. We'll go get him and we'll catch him. And so he and two other guys go. Um, the bar he, owner wants to run the town. He doesn't want to yeah. do it to protect the people. He's not no, doing it no, for anything other sheriff. than he wants. Yeah, he wants to be in charge. More power. Yeah. He wants power. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't really care about helping people. No. So the sheriff finds Nina and he decides he's going to go after Ramon. He knows where he's camping and he gets his own posse together and they all kind of head out that way to, uh, you know, find out and uh, at least confront Ramon. They're lynching Uh, the guy. This is a planned lynching. Yeah. Yeah. Pure and simple. At this point, the town coroner shows up and the doctor is really sus of the town coroner. You can tell he he doesn't like him much. He, He thinks he's a creeper. Um... The guy's so, also playing it up to be a little bit more hokey yeah. and whatnot. Well, the bar owner and his crew, they find Ramon. And they go, why don't you get on your horse, come to town. They're even, they're like, you know, we're not going to lynch you here. You know, they're not They're not going to try to kill him. They want him to, they want to arrest him, get him to town. And as he's going, uh, he tries to run away. And one of the guy ropes him and drags him away. So probably not a good ending for Ramon. Uh, this is uh, probably not going to go as well as he wants. No, it's, uh, it's um, tactfully done, but they yeah. are murdering him off screen. Yes. Uh, they get together and, uh, the sheriff in his posse gets in Ramon's camp and he's like, he was here. I know he was here. And then they all start laughing at him. Like, what do you think? He was going to hang around for you? And they all start kind of laughing at him and he goes, well, we need to find him. They go, we'll wait till tomorrow. And they all just kind of leave. So they all have no respect for the sheriff, which pisses him off. Understandably. Uh, they all leave. And that's actually the end of our first 20 minutes of the movie. All right. So we were kind of hinting at it. We were talking about it, but I decided it was best to hold it for this point when uh-huh. we're in the review when we got through the first 20 minutes. By this point, everything involved with the sheriff feels like it's trying to be that same kind of wacky comedy that he, Jack Gilliam was was in with James Garner in Support Your Local Sheriff and Support Your Local Gunfighter. And if yeah. I'm not mistaken, I think it's... The guy who is supposed to be the bar, the owner of the bar, is like the big redheaded dude, right? Um, yeah, yeah, he's a redheaded dude. Yeah, yeah, but he's he's pretty big and he's he's built like he's stacked and he's a pretty big. No, dude. I don't think he's built. He's an older man. Okay, he looks weakly. That's why he has two guys to help him out. It must be one of his guys then. But there's one of yeah. the one of the guys that's involved with the bar is the really big redheaded dude. Um, he actually was in 
support your local sheriff and support your local gunfighter. He was one of the Danby brothers in uh, Sheriff that were trying to kill James Garner. So yeah. both both of these guys automatically are more comedic actors and specifically in like this Western format. That's what you would hire them for is like your comic relief. And they're both kind of still doing that. Not as much more Jack Gilliam than anything, but pretty much all the stuff involved with the people in the town, specifically buying for the sheriff's attention. Does it not feel like it's played off as like a TV pilot or an old school TV show of this era? Yeah. Yeah. It feels like that. I think Dean Martin's going to just show up every like at least once and crack a joke (laughs) that's what it feels like right like a lot of the stuff is kind of tongue-in-cheek and the sheriff's overreacting and jack gilliam's playing it really broad and it feels like they are going for comedy yeah it really does no you're you're exactly right but then they mix in this serious like jack the ripper inspired like quite obvious set of murders with the prostitute here yeah you know the prostitutes that are being murdered here like and mm-hmm. it's it's brutal murder i and mean it's, these are real murders in there yeah they're brutal right and they are a tip well they're not real real but like in this world this is really happening yes yeah um so you have this goofy weird western that's kind of corny and feels like a tv pilot and then the same characters are hunting down talking about and in the same scenes with coming up later on some very serious procedural investigative work trying to find a serial killer yeah and like the two tones do not meet well at all and it's very jarring to jump back and forth like what's happening but there's a couple of times when jack Gilliam's goofiness actually works for the type of murder mystery that they're doing that yeah. he's being forced into and like those scenes we're, we're about to get into in the next 20 minutes but like at the start of the film it's really fucking jarring and you i know you said this court what did you get me into yeah yeah. (laughs) what what did you get me into over here what are we doing (laughs) what is about to happen what's going on what is happening i felt the same way i'm like oh court what did your blu-ray blind buying tendency get you into now (laughs) it's another fine mess you've gotten us into right i was like slasher in the old west how weird can it get well we're about to find out we're about to find out oh you start the next 20 minutes the new detective's heading into town, and he finds Ramon hanging from a tree. Um, he uh, he has a guy cut down Ramon's body, and they bring it into the town, and that is our next clip. Hey, Tim, Jared, they brought one on the stage. From who in on the stage? Ramon! Burns? Hollyfield? Glad to see you here. What's going on here, Burns? Found him hanging from a tree outside of town. The driver told me it was Verde Canyon. Well, there's your killer, Mr. Hollyfield. This time we got a witness. He's the one I saw at Nina's last night. Your killer was brought in by Mr. Burns here. Found him hanging from a tree at Verde Canyon. Well, that don't change the facts none. He killed Nina. Looks to me like he got what was coming to him. Sheriff, don't you believe that an accused man is entitled to a fair trial according to the law? Don't preach the law to me, Burns. I know the law. The fact is someone took it upon himself to judge this man guilty. Law and order in this town is still your responsibility, Sheriff. Here's that judge's rope. It's evidence. Start with that. Now you listen to me, Burns. I'm the sheriff in this town, and I've been getting along fine without your advice. I'll find out who killed Ramon. In the meantime, we got the killer we've been looking for. Well, he certainly can deny it. Amos, you take Mr. Burns' bag, give him the best room there is. I suggest you settle down in the room and get started. I'll join you in a few minutes. A little later, Mr. Hollyfield. I have some necessary things to do first. Sheriff. You better be right about Ramon. It's a long way to the next town and they already have a sheriff. A young one. Now get Orville over here and bury this man. That's telling him, Jared. Everybody go home and mind your own business. All of you. Go on. Again, Jack Ilium playing it super broad, but 
he's also trying to play politic and it's really dark. They're basically using a hanged man as a political pawn to throw weight around in the town. Even the sheriff's doing it and he's trying to get in yeah. on it where he's trying to play the crowd where he's like, well, you know, as far as the people are concerned, they found their murderer and that sounds yeah, good we, to me. We got him. Yeah. You know, we, we're all done here. But <laughs> what we don't know is there's another reason why the sheriff believes this as well and we'll find out soon enough why. Yeah. I don't want to spoil it because it hasn't happened in the movie yet. <laughs> but like the sheriff at this point has someone that he trusted that basically has said, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why he's so cocksure and headstrong about this. And we'll find that out later. But it basically right now, what it feels like is the sheriff saying, yeah, that's the right man. Everybody be happy. No more murders. You know, we can open the beaches again. The shark's dead. The shark's dead. Everyone, the, you know, our town centennial can go on as planned. Yeah, we can, uh, we, we, we can keep the regatta going. Those breakdancing kids finally saved the goddamn rec center. <laughs> the hooker's legs are open again, which is way more important than a regatta. Yeah. <laughs> so the detective, then he goes, Burns, he goes to speak to the town coroner. And he really flatly asks the town coroner if he believes Ramon could be the killer. And the town coroner is pretty much like, I don't think so. I mean, he says it in a more creepier fashion than that. But in the end, the gist you get is that he doesn't believe Ramon could be the killer. Yeah, so, yeah. The, there is some uh, really interesting, like, odd topsy things that they've got going on with this town coroner guy that they do. Which yeah. is which is way more murder mystery because you always have to have those gross out like examining the body to get evidence moments the, in a murder mystery. By the mystery. way, he's, yeah, he's not just town coroner either. He's uh, the he's, barber, he's the barber, and a tailor. Yeah. yeah, which is pretty common that they would have someone that could do That's all of true. those things, you know, or or at least uh, the tailor and the coroner were usually the same. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean they're measuring somebody either way. Right. So, <laughs> right. Even if uh, they don't build the box themselves, they still have to know the body measure and stuff uh but like the the creepy coroner stuff is very much murder mystery and jack gilliam being around and reacting to that the way that he does and being like over zealous about everything tries to push it into comedy but what it ends up being is like a comic relief that would happen in these kind of murder mysteries and it almost works because he's got that folksy old western charm thing i I don't know i guess it would probably work more for someone else besides me but it was not working for me these two genres together are not chocolate and peanut butter they're more like white chocolate (laughs) and more white chocolate no well then the detective speaks with the lady whose family ran the mine they were like the the, so they were like the head family in town she goes on about uh on and on about how great her son travis was and how how kind he was and all this kind of shit and uh when he wants to ask some more questions the banker actually ends it thinking that the uh the lady is too tired uh she he's very protective of the family they leave uh and the banker tells detective that uh no trap that uh, all was a lie she has too good of an opinion of her son travis was a straight up punk bitch uh he wasted the family's money destroyed the family's name he was just a fucking rancid human being and then the detective so you identified with that character pretty well then huh Uh, i was like man that motherfucker and this guy be fucking spitting right now (laughs) it's like i'm into this guy and uh so, but then the detective leaves the banker with his warning of his own. He goes, no one ends in my interviews but me. So you're like, damn, all right. Jesus, let's, everyone's calm down. Everyone's getting a little heated. If they, if, if Everything's getting just a little too heated. Careers are on the line in this, man. Yeah, right. Um... So then, uh, that night, uh, the sheriff sees the detective having a beer and having some laughs with some of the town folk in the bar, and that pisses him off, because he's like, he's getting all this respect that I'm not getting anymore. So, you know, mother, you know, fuck this guy. So... Yeah, this whole jealousy subplot that they're doing with Jack Ilium is irritating to me. It's not funny. They're trying to make it as funny. They're trying to make it as comic relief, but, um, Jack Ilium works better being confused and outraged at someone playing straight against him having him play it as if he's jealous and pissed off just makes him seem like a petulant irritating child yeah i and agree it, and it doesn't work like i no. know what they were trying to do but he I, I, seems like a big doofus right right like but he's in a bad way yeah like he's the fucking weirdo pudgy kid in the corner pissed off that no one understands how fucking brilliant he is and just kind of brooding over there and i know for a fact that that doesn't work for you because i just described my high school years 
Uh, good times. We're, we, we all have fun here. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, you know, if I'm going to say all those horrible things, I have to make it about me because self-deprecating yeah, yeah. humor is the only fat shaming you're allowed to do now. That is true. You, you can only make fun of yourself for being fat. <laughs> or all the other things that you are because otherwise it's uncouth I am. and you're punching yeah. down. Yeah, yeah, right. Or else we're being rude. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Um. Then the next day, the detective, he investigates where Ramon was found dead. And he finds, like, what looks like a button, right? Like a button or some sort of decorative thing that you would find on a shirt. Um, then he goes and investigates Nina's. And as he's looking through there, all of a sudden we see a knife hit right behind him. And it was the sheriff threw a knife at him. Not at him, but, like, at the door. He goes in, I just want to tell you, you have to always watch your back. And then he's like, I didn't know you'd already be out here. And he goes, I came out here to uh, feed the livestock. And they, he looks at the knife and he goes, that's Ramon's knife. And he goes, well, I can already tell you this isn't the knife that did cause the murders. It's a, it's a pretty tense moment there. Um, and that ends the, that 20 minutes kind of, they leave it with this like really intense moment. See, now this stuff works and this stuff is acted well and they're doing a great job here. Why, why, what is with the inconsistencies, right? Yeah. Right. I don't know. I, I just I couldn't tell you why they why they are the way they are. <laughs> um, but this scene does work. I thought he, the sheriff, uh, the actor who plays him, didn't seem goofy here. He seemed like a man who wanted to, you know, he he wants to keep his job and he thinks he's the best man for the job. Well, and the intimidation tactics that he's trying here are more serious, like the knife throwing and like trying to talk some smack and just show him what's going on. But like yeah. he does a quick face turn when he finds out, no, I fucked up and this needs yeah. to be rectified. And then you see that he actually is the kind of sheriff where he wants to make sure that he is protecting the people. He does care enough about the people to try and do his fucking job you do yeah. see that in in this little last piece here that you're talking about and that's where it gets really tense because you're like oh shit now now let's get a serious investigation but they never keep this tone they keep bouncing around with it and it's weird yeah very weird in fact uh, it's uh very difficult to try to get into it with it constantly going back and forth like this yeah jeffrey from the doom show would fucking love this movie because it dares you to try and finish it it really does like it's like, <laughs> it really it's a, does like it's accosting you like constantly changing its tone and like making sure that it has no interest in keeping an even keel for you in any way shape or form that you yeah. can glom a story from it it just fucking just goes here's your fucking comedy no wait here's your murder mystery here's your murder mystery comedy western here's this here's this it's like just throwing the components at you like it's a fucking shotgun blast Blast at your face that says fuck off. Yeah, right? Like, good luck enjoying this, you bitch. <laughs> and you'd be like, well, why is it gotta be like that? <laughs> right. It's like cursing you. It's like fuck off. Now watch me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> F fuck around, find out, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I to, but I, I don't want to fuck around and find out. I'd rather uh, you just tell me your story and entertain me, movie. <laughs> and they're like, no. <laughs> okay. So the next 20 minutes starts with the detective talking with the boy's mom, who kind of is our prize witness here. And um, uh, he wants to talk to the boy, but she won't allow it. She's kind of she's like, you're calling my son a liar. And he goes, I, I'm not doing that at all. And she's like, well, uh, too bad. You're not going to talk to him. So he's like, uh, fuck. OK. Um, uh, then the boy, he finds the sheriff late at night. And he tries to wake him up because he has something to tell him. And the sheriff sort of has a freak out because he's kind of half into it, half out of it, and shoves the kid. So the kid kind of gets scared and he runs. And he then finds the detective and tells him that he thinks he did something wrong and that he needs to speak to him. So that sort of, that cuts from there. And then we cut to uh, Barnes. He tells the sheriff exactly what the boy told him, that the, he was wrong. Uh, he didn't actually see the murder at all. Um, all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, then uh, they sort of the sheriff has enough, and they have a fist fight, and they beat the living shit out of each other. And when they're laying there, the sheriff goes, "Well, uh, I, he Barnes give, or, or the sheriff gives Barnes some respect. He was like, yeah, you're you're more of a man than I thought you were.'" And then the sheriff's niece shows up, and she, and you know, 
Bar or uh, the sheriff introduces him, then he leaves, and the niece tells Barnes that he's a good sheriff and a, and a good man. It's just things have gotten hard in the town. So then Barnes goes outside, and he and the sheriff kind of have a real good heart to heart. They hash it all out, and they decide they're going to work together to find this murderer. So there at least is one part of the story arc that's done. And now it's a twofold murder. They're going to look for Ramon's murderer, and then they're going to look for the murderer of the women. Okay. And, one of and the I think that part's kind of interesting. Yeah, what we need to kind of talk about here specifically specifically though is when the sheriff said what he said at the town meeting and was really blessed for like you know saying no we got the man that we were looking for for this murder when Ramon had been hung you know like this is that that means that, that you found our murderer kind of thing or whatever the things that he was saying he's going by this boy that he is friends with and he trusts yes. and he cares about telling him that Ramon is the one that he saw do the killing mm -hmm. and the townspeople that went and lynched Ramon went on that as well we don't really yeah. see the kids say that we needed no. to see the kid telling the, the kid sheriff said that. he saw Ramon with him. And everyone in the town changes that to uh, that uh, that inferred that the Ramon was the killer. When the kid never said he saw Ramon, you know, kill her, he only saw Ramon with her. Right. When she was alive. But the, the thing is, the kid said that stuff, but the sheriff didn't do anything because the kid didn't say specifically Ramon is the killer. Yeah. What I'm getting at is the kid comes back later and says, that, you know, he only found the body. He didn't actually see the murder. And everybody, including the sheriff, for some reason in this movie, believed that at the point. Because he gets upset when he finds out mm -hmm. that the kid didn't tell him the truth. Like, he's genuinely hurt. Well, and I think he's nervous because he feels bad that, you know... Uh, I th the kid thought he was doing something right and all that. And, you know, he does care for that kid. So, right, right. But he's genuinely upset. There's a, a, probably a, a good layer number of emotions, but I'm sure he's also hurt that the kid did this because the kid really fucked up things for the sheriff here to, to do it that way. If the kid did yeah. say something like that. So it's heavily implied that the kid was basically telling everyone that he saw Ramon and the killing. And that's what they thought he was trying to say. Everybody may have misinterpreted it but everybody believed it 100 percent and the sheriff was going to go out hunting for him but the other people just went and did it because the sheriff yeah. was trying to focus in on investigating the murder aspect of it and looking mm -hmm. at the scene and for the old west there's a strange amount of forensics going on with sheriffs and things looking at murders and by the way the sheriff didn't want to hang ramon uh and i will give credit not even the bar owner wanted to hang ramon they all wanted to bring him into jail and bring him before a judge. Um, we're going to find out here in a little bit how things went kind of awry with that. Um, yeah, let's just move into it then. <laughs> yeah. The, we cut to the guys who killed Ramon. Um, they all start to argue with one another. The guy who actually did it. Uh, and it seems like they didn't, he didn't, Ramon didn't die for being hung. I think when they were dragging him, the rope got around the uh, Ramon's neck instead of his chest. And it snapped his neck. So then they made it look like they hung him. And he's kind of really depressed about it. Because he was like, he didn't want, he's like, I can't believe, you know, why did I, you know, he didn't want to do that. Um... And then one of the other guys goes, and his name's Verge, is the bar owner. One of the other guys is like, well, Verge, it's kind of your fault. If you weren't so headstrong about wanting to be sheriff, we wouldn't even have gone after Ramon. And one of uh, Verge's ladies there, probably like the head madam uh, in the bar, she was like, yeah, you know, that's kind of true. You have been really wanting to be sheriff. Why would you want to be sheriff? And that leads to him slapping her around, saying, don't question what I want to do. And then we cut to the sheriff and the boy. They actually have a good heart to heart where the sheriff says he's not mad at him for not telling him sooner. And then old sheriff also, he's like, you're not scared of me, are you? Because of what happened when you tried to wake me up. And the boy said, no, they kind of have a heart to heart where everything gets figured out. Yeah, the sheriff probably drank himself to sleep and is a mean drunk. And that's why yeah. he was sleeping in the cell. And the kid went to go wake him up and saw how mean of a drunk he can be. Yeah. At least the sheriff that's... didn't backhand the kid. No, yeah, right? No, sheriff. Shit. He just was like, hey, you scamp, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only a little more mean and forceful. It was still pretty scary. And yeah, it still would be for a boy to, in, in, in who you're close to this adult and you like him. And, you know, maybe you even think of him as like a father figure and for him to act like that will get to you. Yeah, it scares the living shit out of you, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you know, there there is that aspect of it. And we're back to the parts right now that you just described here where it starts to feel like a drama and it's actually like taking shape and there's
there's more mystery being unfolded and you find out all these stories and the people are talking. And while the acting may not be like super dramatic or, you know, really kind of lull you into that sense of the drama, you know, because they're, you know, more comedic actors or or, you know, not not uh, more dramatic actors that, that are in this yeah. film. And they're trying. They're they're getting there for the most part. And Jack Ilium, actually, when he's doing his dramatic parts here with the kid, works really well. And this is some of the best acting I've ever seen this guy do. And this stuff all kind of works. But then it's going to shift tones on us again, automatically. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fuck you. You don't get to get used to what this film is going to make you feel like. Yeah, you don't. You don't get used to that. So the madam uh, from the Bar, the bartender Verge beat up. She actually shows up and visits Barnes, and that is our next clip. You win or lose? I uh, win some and I lose some. How about you? <laughs> I never had a chance. Mr. Burns, do you know Virgil Hooker? Should I? Well, if you mount the man that killed Ramon, you should. Hooker killed Ramon? It's with his two friends, Horace and Lute Doolin. Well, I don't dodge your word, Myra, but... It's just what it is, your word against theirs. Do you know what this is? Yes. Luke Doolin wears conchas like that on his vest. This could be what we need. Don't leave this room under any circumstances. You'll be safe here. So did the hooker end up in witness protection with them? Is that what was going on with that? Don't leave that room at the end of the clip. I can't remember. Well, it was pretty much like he doesn't want her to leave so that Verge can't find her and beat the crap out of her some more. Yeah. So witness protection, more or less. Yeah. So, um, so then Barnes and the sheriff, they decide they're going to watch the group and they're watching them. And then Barnes sends the kid to the bar and he gives one of the guys a little package and the, he opens up the package and it's the button from his own missing vest. Um, so uh, then the, those two guys, Verge's two guys, they decide they're going to leave. They're going to get the hell out of there. The heat's getting too bad. And uh, Verge kind of really loses it and says, no, you're not. Brings out a gun and starts shooting and kills them both. Then he starts to leave, but the sheriff is saying he's going to stop him. Verge says he can't. Starts to pull out a gun, but the sheriff shoots him, kills him dead. And like the town people are all like, congratulating. Like the, the respect's coming back from the town for the sheriff after seeing that yeah because he just gunned a man down who had a good bead drawn on him but like yeah. super quick and you know they, they did the typical jack Williams an amazing shot that's why everybody put us up with this goofy ass thing yeah yeah right he's uh he knows how to be murdering people if you need to so um and now that f- goes right into our final 20 minutes yeah let's just roll on it's good roll on all right barnes uh then finds he goes back to his room and finds that woman she is hung and her throat is slit she is dead. Uh, they talk to the doctor, and that's our next clip. Stab wounds were the same in all the cases. Neat, precise punctures. Except where the flesh was pulled away by a ripping motion. In your opinion, then, Myra was killed by the same person who killed Nina. No doubt about it. The circumstances were all similar. What can you tell me about Myra that might help? Not much. That whole bunch from hookers stayed to themselves most of the time. Did uh, Travis Mescal ever go there? Yeah, when Hooker was my deputy, he did. See, Hooker kept getting him out of one mess after another. Then uh, Travis knew Myra. Just as well as you want to know anybody. And the other women? Same. None of them cared much whose bed they slept in. Yeah, when it come to women, Travis knew them all. How did Mrs. Mescal feel about his, uh, associations? She's the one who has my sympathy, Mr. Burns. With Travis, her grief was in life as well as in death. She lost both ways. When you examined Travis, uh, were his wounds the same as the others? I don't know. I never saw Travis' body. Of course I saw Travis. How do you suppose I buried him? Neither Dr. Fairchild nor the sheriff saw the body. Isn't that unusual, Mr. Ainsley? Perhaps. I was the first summoned to the house when I arrived. Mrs. Mescal was in a state of total despair. She insisted that I handle all of the arrangements personally. 
in front of it, please. You must have a very special relationship with Mrs. Mescal. And why not? Does it seem so odd that I should attract a woman of her standing? Not odd. Unexpected. I was under the impression that you had no particular sentiment for anyone in this town. Yet I sense a deep attachment to Mrs. Mescal. Mrs. Mescal is a gentle lady. She understands me. I understand her. As good friends should. Elizabeth. Mrs. Mescal and I have a great deal in common. We all need someone. Then you broke the law because of your allegiance to Mrs. Mescal. Application of the law was always subverted where the name Mescal is concerned. I'd always considered you a highly principled man. Travis was horribly mutilated. His mother wanted him to be remembered as he was in life, not in death. I simply granted her that wish. Is there a law against that? So the plot thickens. No one's seen the body. Yeah, so this starts to get a little bit weird. Um, the first hooker that died, they also said that her son was killed too, correct? Correct. Uh, no, no, no. They're talking about the Travis being the son uh, of the older lady was killed. He was the first one killed. Then it was just hookers after that. Right. Right. Okay. No other sons. Okay, not at the... Yeah, that's what I meant. Like, this lady's yeah. son was one of the first deaths that was done he with a knife. He was the very first death. But... But... After no one that, ever saw his body. Yeah, but then a large amount of prostitutes in this area started disappearing from this small town. That is, yes, and that is true. And or ladies that are considered ladies of ill repute. Yes, and <laughs> usually they were found all cut up as well. Right, but we only have seen so far the female's deaths. Yeah, we never saw Travis's death. And no one has seen Travis's body, except for allegedly the coroner. Right. Right. Yeah, this is where it all gets kind of weird. And I kind of like it. So far, I'm liking it. Now the mystery part, I'm kind of liking this. I'm like, oh, they're, everyone's getting weird now. This just is where it transitions from just a murder mystery, like who done it, into a straight up giallo, because it starts getting weird and funky. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um... The uh, the coroner, he visits the old lady, and he says he wants some money from her, some more money to amend their deal. He goes, but and it's for him to leave town. And she agrees. And he kind of flips because she's like, don't make it seem like you're giving me money. Uh, you know, it, 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 he, he gets really weird about all this. But she gives him the money anyway, and he will be leaving town, and she is quite pleased about that. Um, they... Uh, uh, then Burns and the sheriff, they check the grave and find that there is no body in the in the crypt. So they visit the old lady and she says there's no body because he was cremated and says, you know, th but they didn't want anybody to know that he was cremated. And so then that night, Burns is investigating the medicine the lady takes. She has these packets of medication she puts in her coffee to help her with her moods. It's got to be cocaine, straight cocaine, because this is the Old West, and doctors would prescribe it. And that would help many with a better the, mood. Yeah, that would help you with your moods. Uh, so uh, then we see the, the – we cut to the um, – uh, the coroner and he is drunk talking to one of the uh the dead lady for, who was found in Barnes' room and he gets mad at her and he yells at her and then he beats her dead body and he's just yelling about how his own life is shit and um and then he turns and he is stabbed and killed by being stabbed in the chest so coroner is now dead so fuck off, I guess. Yeah, someone is silencing the coroner and trying to cover their tracks, even though he's already testified. Uh, yep. Well, then Barnes and the doctor, they uh, finish up uh, some investigating in our final clip. Doctor, when did Mrs. Mescal first start taking this? In a few months. I can give you the exact date. If you Later. Tell me when she received her last supply. One week ago to the day. That supply is nearly gone. Well, that's impossible. I gave her enough to last a month. Are you sure? When I arrived here four days ago, her medication box was full. 
Now it's practically empty. Mr. Burns, suppose she just put some in another container. Suppose this medication, taken in larger quantities, served a purpose other than what it was intended for. Medically speaking, that is possible. Then let's discuss and examine every alternative you can think of. All right. We know arsenic iodide is the main component. Let's see now. now here we are. Arsenic in various compounds is commonly used to stimulate the metabolism in extreme cases of depression. Listen to this. Recent experiments with arsenic have proved that when used in substantial dosage, it is beneficial in the treatment of severe anemia and various skin diseases, especially syphilis. Syphilis. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Syphilis. How <laughs> dare they? Okay, so... Scandalous. <laughs> so we're moving now into the Giello territory even more, and they're starting to bring up syphilis and an old woman. Ew. Thanks, movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you looking to get down, or what are we doing here? <laughs> I didn't know you guys liked to party like that. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Paul's Boutique, I think it is, is the album that that's on. If I'd known it was that kind of party, I'd have stuck my dick in the mashed potatoes. <laughs> I also think that's from the show Waiting. It's the kind of party I want to stick my dick in the mashed potatoes. Ah, good times. So, um, Burns then updates, uh, or Barnes updates the sheriff about what's happening. Uh, the sheriff's niece, uh, we cut to, is playing piano for the old lady. Well, the old lady says she has something nice to show her. And they go upstairs, and it's this nice blue drape. She's like, oh, it's beautiful. And she goes, oh, but that's what I want to show you. And she pulls the drape, and there's a cage with her syphilis, crazed, deranged son in it. Uh, the old lady throws the woman in there, but she, uh, the niece in there, but the niece is able to fight uh, the guy off, hits him in the head with a vase. She runs away. Uh, the old lady goes chasing, grabs the knife. Uh, she, uh, the, the niece falls kind of down the stairs. And as the mom starts closing in, deranged chlamydia son grabs her. Syphilis. Or what did I say? Chlamydia. Chlamydia. Oh, yeah. Syphilis. The crazy syphilis son grabs her. And then the sheriff and detective run in. Uh, they uh, shoot the lady, uh, so she falls. She takes the son with her off the stairs, stabbing the son as he goes down. They both lay there dead. Um, the next day, uh, Barnes is getting ready to leave, and all of a sudden the sheriff and the niece show up, and they're all going to leave too. The sheriff gives the badge to the town banker, says there's nothing left for him really in this town, uh, says a tearful goodbye to the young boy. They all leave. Roll credits. So there were uh, two of them now becoming friends, going off together, and actually being a really good investigative team together. Does that not feel as though this should have been a pilot for a TV show? That yeah. They were traveling Old West detectives solving crimes. Pretty much. It seems like that. With yeah. the niece who is slowly but surely becoming sweet on the other yeah. detective guy. And he's kind of okay with it because he likes the man now. Because they yeah. had a knockdown, drag out, slobber knocker fight. <laughs> I mean, that pretty much seems it. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're kind of on the ball with that. Yeah. that's I got that sensation. I know that this was like, you know, shot as a movie. It's a full-fledged movie movie. They never intended it to be. But I have watched plenty of those pilots never turned into full-fledged TV shows. Thankful mostly to mst3k having so many of them placed on their their show but also just because you end up catching them on tbs and stuff like that um they still play them sometimes and all of that and this is definitely one of those wanted to be or felt like it was going to be a pilot to a tv show for not necessarily a murder mystery every week but it would work that if they they travel and specialize in you know bizarre murders i could have totally seen how that would have been popular in the 70s and it could have probably worked yeah (laughs) you know what i mean but then they just go like ultra dark and ultra weird and they like really try to hammer home that this is Jack the Ripper in the Old West you know (laughs) like they even bring in that whole like pissed off that you got syphilis from hookers and that's why you're murdering them kind of thing for Jack the Ripper. that's why you're crazy. Right. Like it's syphilis brain. Right. Right. And then to have the son be caged and kept like an animal 
you know, because he started showing the signs and that's really what drove her to go kill. Yeah. You know, but she just said, the, like, initially you think she killed the prostitute. And I thought for sure that the stuff without all that stuff showing up on the son's face, I thought for sure that what we saw was the prostitute that gave the son the syphilis and the son leaving and then her being murdered once it was discovered. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. No, that that beginning part, that was just the, some other guy. Just some random dude that may or yeah. may not have gotten syphilis before being murdered. <laughs> well, before I mean, the it's woman the old murdered. West. They all got syphilis. <laughs> yeah. What's the line? Uh, one of my favorite lines from um, Bram Stoker's Dracula that Coppola did that... Uh, um, Sir Anthony Hopkins delivers, I believe it's civilization and civilization have worked together in hand in hand, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> that that sounds like something that should be true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> something along those lines where, you know, civilization has progressed as much as civilization has. <laughs> well, no shit, man. Yeah. Uh, Your whole thieving, whoring generation. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's like a nonstop cycle. <laughs> Every generation <laughs> is thieving and whoring. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So the, the uneven tone, the weirdness of the movie, the way it bounces around and stuff like that, like ordinarily that really really works for me and I find it quirky and entertaining but so much of this feels like and reminds me of an attempt at a pilot for a TV show in the 70s to the point where the uneven tone just feels like decisions that they didn't know what they wanted to make and to see what test audiences would jump on or something like that and it it does it totally swings for the fences it tries to mash up a bunch of different stuff and make you a smoothie of awesome and sometimes that works with these kinds of elements but with this one they jump around too much and they change it just a little too much to the point where it just kind of gets confusing and kind of makes it feel like you don't know where to take the line on things. And just when you start feeling relaxed and laughing about some of the things that Jack Gilliam's character does, you get irritated and annoyed by him becoming kind of a petulant fucking child. And then they turn it around and, you know, jump into like more serious murder stuff. <laughs> then they come back and do more of the goofy shit with the townspeople. It just jumps around so much with the tone that it just becomes kind of off-putting and it's very difficult to finish and watch because like it, it, it just like it's so jarring. You're like, oh, fuck, what now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Now what's happening? Right. And if this was the intention of the filmmakers to make this as uncomfortable a watch for you as possible, I see bold choice to you, but I doubt that's what they wanted. No, I, I think they were trying to go for a straight murder mystery with a little bit of horror mixed in. And uh, they just cast some weird characters to get that done. We joke about being over caffeinated and, you know, being coked out and stuff, but I really truly feel like this is a script written by a coke-addled brain. Yeah, I do too, yeah. I feel <laughs> like Definitely it's is. a film produced by coke-addled brains. <laughs> like, they're so on to the next moment, and it just jumps so rapidly and shifts in tone and emotion and thought that it just feels like what I assume it feels like to be on cocaine, because I don't personally know. Yeah, I mean, why would we know that? But does it not have that same kind of jumpy thing that you have heard described from being on such a substance? Yes, things I've, like... From watching um, the uh, fucking like uh, behind the music things and you know all the stars talk about what it's like being on drugs so that's kind of what i guess i i guess it would be like yeah right it's just like it feels like the way that the kind of conversations i have seen in documentary footage or whatever of people that are all coked out or just the portrayals of people that are all coked out the way that they behave it feels like this is their inner dialogue trying to write a story with that same kind of jumping around and shift in tone and pace and everything like that like it just yeah. it just feels so frantic and off-putting and weird that it just that's the only thing I can think is that this was produced by coke adult brains probably I mean for it would it would make sense for the time because it's certainly that's what it made me feel like it made me feel like I'm watching this with a coke adult brain trying to pay attention yeah because I'm all over the place when I'm watching it that's what it feels like so if I guess if you want that kind of feeling then I guess a knife for the ladies for you yeah, right it's, it's yeah it's for you man this, uh, this film is for like you this. yeah <laughs> and I think it's on tubby so if it gives you that same kind of tweaked out, coked out, weird, paranoid feeling that we're talking about, and that's what you like, go for it. Yeah, have 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 a hell of a good time with it. Yeah, I'm not going to say that I wasn't somewhat entertained because I was, but it definitely was an uncomfortable watch for me. It it was it was definitely weird. <laughs> I, I, and it wasn't uncomfortable for me. It just kept getting weirder, or not weirder. I guess it kept 
like you said, going from one thing to another to another to another, like in, in genre wise, it could stick to a genre. Yeah, so it's hard to get into it. It was tweaking my fucking anxiety. It jumped around so much is what I'm getting at. <laughs> It's about fucking time. No. <laughs> yeah, like it's so fucking hard to tweak my anxiety. In anybody's anxiety anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my anxiety goes to 11, brah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, shit. I wake up in the morning nowadays, my anxiety's up there. All right, so enough talking about anxiety, because it's giving me yeah. anxiety. Let's, uh, let's move on and do some psyop news, man. All right. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. done a decent enough job finding music that fits this film certainly better than the uh evil woman theme song thing they play at the end of the movie right jesus <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna rip that truth be told but then i'm like i don't like it it's not worth it <laughs> no sir i don't like it <laughs> if i get a copyright hit i'm not getting it for this fucking song yeah right it's not good <laughs> Yeah, but if it's I, not worth it. If I do get another copyright hit, it won't be for this Psyop News. From our man in the field, Robert. Ah, this was, you were going to say it last week, but I wasn't trusting you. So now I have to yeah. trust you and hope that you're not going to politicize us again. Uh, I, I don't think it's the same thing. Upper Peninsula man awakens to intruder holding gun to head demanding his cats. <laughs> oh, you fucking prick. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good uh, people. Pretty good people. <laughs> you motherfucker. Really? <laughs> uh, Huntington County, Michigan. You've probably heard of a cat burglar, but a bizarre case reported in Michigan's Upper Peninsula gives a new literal meaning to the off-used term. All cops are bumbling dummies. According to the Lurian Police Department in Huntington County, a man awoke just after 4.14 a.m. on Wednesday to find another man pointing a gun at his head and demanding he give him two cats that live there. America is a bunch of cunts. Okay, first of all, you can take my cat when you pry it from my cold dead fingers. <laughs> the man who broke into the home without permission 
that's a weird way for this article to be written. I mean, if you break How into a home. How else do you break into a home? I mean, usually, if you break into a home, it's kind of done oh, without permission. What, what if they're doing like a role playing thing and he's playing the like evil burglar, right? Then you would oh, have permission shit. to break into the home, right? Yeah, but I mean, is it, that's not breaking in then. Technically, if you still break to enter, you are breaking and entering. That's maybe, yeah, if the doors are still locked, so you have to do something to get in, then yeah. But if you leave the doors unlocked, it's no longer breaking in. Well, breaking and entering is really in the eye of he who presses the charges. <laughs> well, but if they're asking to break in, no one's pressing charges. <laughs> you would hope, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, back to the story. Yeah, uh, the man who broke into the home without permission took one of the cats before leaving, according to police. Police believe the suspect knew the homeowner prior to the home invasion. Well, why well, else yeah, would you would... be stealing the cats, right? Right, yeah, you would think that'd be the case. Necrophilia could be overlooked. No, no it probably shouldn't be. Um, uh, so he was located by police a short time later, according to a news release. Uh, and the gun was seized during the arrest, and he was booked at the Hunton County Jail on charges of home invasion and felonious assault. Police told uh, WLUC TV6 that it is unknown if the cat has been located following the suspect's arrest. The incident is still under investigation, and the suspect and victim have not been identified. Officers uh, were assisted at the scene and in the search by the Keyshawn uh, County Sheriff's Office. The hell with the police? I'm going to stockpile all my guns because cops don't so, help you. Don't steal cats, people. That's not fucking cool. This is confusing on multiple levels, but, like, what the fuck? Trying to take somebody's cats at gunpoint? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucked up, man. Well, <laughs> yes, it is. Like just Very. just stealing somebody's pet in general. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't be stealing pets, you're, man. You're, I, I don't know why. That's fucking taking me a, the wrong way. Yeah, you're taking a fucking family member. It's not like it just showed up on your fucking doorstep. You were forcibly yeah. removing this thing from its home at yeah, gunpoint. Exactly. Yep. It's catnapping. Exactly. That's fucked up. <laughs> fucking bullshit <laughs> alright give me another story cause it's fucking depressing and we're really really <laughs> not that far along in an episode right now we are not holy fuck well th- I mean this was not a long movie let's, <laughs> let's look at it that way too no and just talking about it again tweaked my anxiety <laughs> yeah. alright this is also from Robert our man, man in the ar- field man Yeah. man arrested after driving man to Lincoln Hospital in Bucket it, it, it bucket of stolen front end loader, police say. Is this so local this is news? in our own backyard. So it's local news. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, a 32-year-old who drove his friend to a Lincoln hospital in the bucket of a front end loader Friday night was arrested for DUI and felony theft after blocking the ambulance bay with the stolen machinery, police say. Uh, Officer Aaron Spikler said Jordan Evans had taken the $75,000 front end loader from 6th and Plum Streets to Bryan West Campus and showed up at the hospital with a 40-year-old man in the bucket just before 11 p.m. on Friday. Evans was taking the man. I'm advocating corpse fucking here. Evans was taking the man to the hospital because he was injured, she said. Police saw a bottle of alcohol in the vehicle and believed Evans was intoxicated. You have to be intoxicated to do this. This is like traces of death fucked a porno. The owner, Taylor Excavating, said he didn't have permission to take the loader. (laughs) They arrested Evans on suspicion of felony theft. Fourth offense DUI and driving it during a 15 year license. Uh, oh my God! You license can't pay suspension. Your bill. I could Jesus. probably fix that for a blowy. Wait, How 15 much? year? 15 year. I mean, this was his fourth DUI. 15. Okay, I did hear you correctly. He was already time. on a 15 year. Who knows what it's going to be now? <laughs> Lifetime. Yeah, because th- th- he was on a three. Now this is his fourth DUI offense, and he steals so, heavy equipment to yeah. move a body. Yeah, uh, Spikler said his blood alcohol content tested 084 percent, more than double the legal limit at the jail. Jesus fucking Christ! I'm telling you right now, man, that's some hardcore drinking. <laughs> I mean, that's like you're lucky you're not dead. You're preserving yourself in alcohol for your fucking undertaker right? levels I mean, of drinking. Holy shit, that's ridiculous. That guy is marinating at at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, at this point he's pickling. Yeah, yeah, well, that's actually very true as well. <laughs> It all depends on what he's drinking. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's not brine. Yeah, right. <laughs> can, you, can you just drink some beef juice or something? Intake something other than alcohol for one moment, it, sir. It should. It will help you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, uh, anyway, that's it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I don't know what else you want to do. <laughs> Fuck it. It'll be a really short fucking episode. That's all I've got, man. We got two. Yeah, I mean, we did I like. We got a lot else, man. Yeah, we, we did news stories. We, <laughs> we, we did two news stories and fucking a short ass movie. Yeah, and I padded the front of the episode. I did the best that I could for this. <laughs> yeah, I think we knew this was going to be a short one. <laughs> oh, it's not the length of your episode. It's how you record it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. Ending it. Ending it. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema Psyops, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. We've all learned something this week, something very special that we need to acknowledge. And that's that getting syphilis in the Old West can lead your mom to murder a bunch of prostitutes and keep you hostage in a cage and occasionally feed you underage girls. That's just wrong. That's just weird. That's a that's a strange thing to put in a movie, really. But anyway, folks, when you're feeling old timey, you just got to remember we're available at legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. That's the main landing and launching page for this here whole entire podcast that we're a part of. You're all also available to come to our Facebook group, Cinema Psyops, where I'd like to welcome you all to enjoy our memes. We're well known for our memes there. Oh, Matt, would you like to tell the folks a little more about those memes? Uh, we repurpose them, and they are only the highest quality of memes, by the way. The highest quality. Why? Oh, we take. Well, I do hear tell that Court Psyops himself curates those memes. Like, he goes out there and steals them, I mean, procures them himself, and we then shares them. them. With the world. Is that correct, Matt? That is very correct. Oh, wow. And he does, a, he does a damn good job of it, too. I believe that this podcast could use a little bit more folksy, good-natured humor with its necrophilia, Matt. It worked well, in the movie. I, yeah, I mean, listen, sometimes you just need some down-home cooking incest. And uh, there you go. <laughs> well, I'm available for your down-home cooking incest on Facebook as Court Sops. <laughs> Matt is also available there as Matt Sop for your fucked-up necrophiliac wet dreams. I guess necrophilia can be overlooked, right? So I've heard you say before, you armit. You can do this newfangled thing called email feedback to Matt. He is psyopmatt, A with a circle around it, gmail.com. That's, uh, that's like a telegram. 
Yeah. yeah. You can also email feedback to court. Let him know this is the dumbest fucking sketch he's ever come up with on the face <laughs> of the earth. He's a fucking ah, idiot. This is good. Early frontier court. <laughs> And he should be run out on a rail. <laughs> He's available at CinemaSyops at SymbolShameMail.com. You can also twit a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on that porn bot filled utopia known as Twitter. These aren't even words. Twitter is a word. It's just, it's it's different now. Like, like, uh, uh. What the uh, hell uh, is a try try freaking a underscore? You guys would have, uh, Ad you know, court like, underscore psyops. Listen, if you're not going to do it right, just get off the fuck. Jeez, I'm, I'm there. Okay. Yeah, get the fuck. <laughs> uh, fucking. I'm just saying varmint. That's kind of a made up word that you guys had. So I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> at court underscore psyop. He is available there as at psyop Matt. There's also the Instagram there that I run like I do this show. Extremely bad. Bad. God damn. Just chill out, man. It's a repository for all of our memes available there for you at Instagram. Well, if you made it all the way through this shit show of a fucking show, possibly the worst episode in the 294 previous episodes that are available for you there at the well, Legion Podcast site. That's saying something. Yeah, that's a that's a challenge. I, I challenge you all to go back through every episode we've ever done and find one worse than this one. Well done, man. <laughs> Pump up those numbers. <laughs> well, while you're out there pumping up our numbers, don't forget to pump up the iron <laughs> and kick the fuck out of this weekend. Make it to your bitch. recording one two three good <laughs> waveform looks good everything yeah all right i got you over i got a hood on with the headphones on over top of the hood i thought it'd be okay because it's just like a real thin t-shirt material but yeah. that's not working so i'm gonna have to drop the hood and put the headphones on you were gonna have to be have a cold head no i'm gonna put the hood back on over top of the headphones which looks even worse but at least I'll, at least it won't sound any weirder than it already yeah, did yeah, that's true yeah it was like a super thin t-shirt material it makes no sense at all huh. <laughs> colder in the basement than usual uh, I'm just colder than yeah. everything now. It's ridiculous. I'm always fucking cold. But yes, the basement is cold because the air conditioning has to run for the upstairs. Same here. That's exactly what's going on. I have my hoodie on right now. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind. I actually kind of like long sleeves and I, you know, the more I cover of my body, the better life is for everyone. That seems to be the same for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So, you know, I, I'm it okay with, weird, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with like all season long sleeves. Like if that's my life in the future, I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, same, <laughs> same for me. <laughs> all right. Let's stop fucking around and record here. Okay. All right. Well, fucking hey, let's do something about this then. <laughs> God doesn't that's see when you do anal. Wrong one. I mean, that that's what I heard. <laughs> not but... in shape, but I don't know how to perform an abortion. <laughs> nope, that's not it either. That, that's also true. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh my God, just fucking incest already. Unless she kicked him out. <laughs> Maybe she woke up and like, get out of my bed. I'm not comfortable. Yeah, well, what, are you, what are you doing in here? <laughs> <laughs> which is, which this is, is a... not for you. You didn't, you didn't pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> which is a phrase I've had to utter many a times. Get out of my bed. I don't want you here. <laughs> <laughs> Will you please go? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a bed that you stay in. This is a bed that you occupy. And yeah. you're done. Your time here is done. Move on. 
Oh, good times. Here. Fuck, I lost my place. <laughs> I was like getting ready to ask if you were still there, but I'm like, well, silence cuts out easier. The medicine the lady takes. She has these packets of medication she puts in her coffee to help her with her moods. It's got to be cocaine, straight cocaine, because this is the Old West, and doctors would prescribe it. And that would help many with a better the, mood. Yeah, that would help you with your moods. So, and she puts in her fucking coffee, and I'm like, how much more fucking pumped up do you need to be? Whoa, 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 whoa. As someone who has made coffee with a caffeinated water, <laughs> I can tell Pretty you pumped up. a lot more. Yeah. A lot more, yeah. <laughs> Those days are long behind me, my friend. My caffeine I would, overdose and abuse is long gone. You want to see sounds. <laughs> uh, I will tell you this much. I have had enough caffeine in my system at one point in time that I started seeing, um, like, out of the corner of my eyes, my vision started to get blurry and wavy and multiple colors started happening. Yeah, that's usually not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I was toxic at that point with the caffeine. But yes, I have gone that far in my precocious youth. Ah, you're so precocious. <laughs> I was at the time. Now, yes. now if I have more than like <laughs> X amount of caffeine in a day, I'm not sleeping that night. So yeah, right. Yeah, and then, then, you, like, then you gotta offset it by taking melatonin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, melatonin. Yeah, that's exactly what you're taking. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's move on. Sh shut up! You know, this would have been so weird if you hadn't made it weird. <laughs> Story of my life, man. Yeah, right? They uh, finish up uh, some investigating in our final clip. I got two left. Did I play one and not delete it? Play the one that's... Stab wounds with the same and all the casing. Yeah, Stab you didn't safe. delete that one. Okay. Is this so local this is news? in our own backyard. So it's local news. Cool. Yeah. Um, Give me a one second here. Sorry, everything went crazy. In other local news, having recreational and or medical marijuana in Nebraska will kill your children. Yes, of course. But let's not get into that. Huh. After blocking the ambulance bay with the stolen machinery, police say. Hang on. I got to uh, dime myself out for something. I'm giving you shit uh, for being political and you have downtime to read your fucking story. And then I fucking pull that bullshit. Yeah, you really did. <laughs> uh, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, I got to call myself on that because that's fucking horse shit, Court. Fuck you're like, off. You're like, don't get so political, Matt. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> then you have to go. Weed's going to kill your kids. <laughs> <laughs> God fucking damn it. I hate our fucking governor. Okay. The, the, all, <laughs> okay yeah, we're going to yeah. move it all to Altex. Sorry. Go ahead to come to our Facebook group, Cinema Psyops, where I'd like to welcome you all to enjoy our memes. We're well known for our memes there. Are you with we me? We repurpose those memes. <laughs> okay, you're right with yeah. me. I'm just waiting for you to take a fucking breath. I don't know where you're getting this. <laughs> I was making it up as I go along. I know, I'm like, God damn, I'm waiting to get myself in there, but you just kept fucking going. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you're fine. I'm just like, well, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Well, I'm available for your down-home cooking incest on Facebook as Court Sops. <laughs> How did I do that and not break character? I, I have no idea. Matt is also available for your fucked up nigger. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so I've heard you say before, you varmint. You <laughs> varmint. I'm losing the plot. Okay. <clears throat> Frontier Court sounds an awful lot like Court trying to do Bruce Springsteen as well. <laughs> I've never done Bruce Springsteen, actually. Uh, well, you just did, actually. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Get the fuck out of this weekend, make it your bitch. <laughs>
<laughs> pump up the iron? What am I? Pump up the, pump up the iron? I don't know. What, what is that? Uh, I'm so fucking punch drunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking A. Me too. Chat. Oh, man. Good times. <laughs> Are you still recording? Uh, not anymore.